required a subscription to use it. Welcome to Junior Historians. I'm Darcy, the middle school librarian at the St. Charles Public Library. Joining me is Lindsay Judd, the director of the St. Charles History Museum. Today, in honor of the grand reopening, the Junior Historians are exploring the history of the St. Charles Public Library. Lindsay, can you tell us about the first version of our library? In 1888, 12 citizens of town met to make plans for the first library association, which was legally incorporated in 1889. To be a member of the library, patrons had to pay $2 a year to check out books. Originally located in rented rooms at 203 East Main Street, the collection grew to 3,000 books by 1900 and typically had about 200 books a week checked out. This is where the office is currently located. Wow, I didn't know that this library wasn't where the library always was. That's right. By 1906, the Library Association decided to become a public institution in hopes of better serving the St. Charles community. Residents of the town voted to form a tax-supported public township library, and the first board of directors met in April of that year. A letter was sent to Andrew Carnegie to request funds to build a new library. Mr. Carnegie was well known for supporting libraries all over the country. He was willing to give the people of St. Charles $12,500 to build a public library. The money helped greatly and local donations of $2,500 made up the rest of the cost of construction. The site, which was selected for the new library, was located on the east side of the Fox River and had previously been a garbage dump, which had been turned into an ice skating rink. Residents who lived on the west side of the river criticized the location due to how far it was from their homes. It doesn't seem very far by today's standards, but I'm sure if they had to walk or ride a horse, it would have seemed much longer to get here. Absolutely. By December of 1908, the library had been completed. The building was designed by Chicago architects Phillips, Rogers, and Woodyacht, and was done in the classical revival style. Miss Mary Stewart was, was the one and only librarian for 21 years until 1929. Only one librarian? I can't even imagine that. Well, at that time, the library was one room with a fireplace. It had a basement and a hall was built upstairs with a washroom and a small kitchen to be used as a meeting space for community groups. So the librarian didn't have a huge area to cover like we do now. In 1933, the library underwent its first renovation, during which the basement was updated to become a children's room. The room was paneled in pine and child-friendly tables, chairs, and shelves were constructed. Oh, that's where our staff lounge is located now. Uh, what else happened to the building since then? The town had grown from about 5,000 residents in 1908 to 16,000 residents in 1960. So, in 1962, a referendum was passed to use $255,000 in building bonds to add an addition to the library, which opened two years later in 1964. The expansion added an additional 7,640 square feet to the main floor and a basement area of 3,950 square feet. The new main floor had all of the library's service desks and all of its collections, which was about 50,000 books. It also provided seating for 90 people throughout the space. The original Carnegie building was then used for office and storage space. If the children's portion of the library was housed on the same floor as the adult collections, when did the youth department move downstairs? The next renovation project happened in 1973 and the children's department was moved into a newly remodeled lower level at that time. A few years later in 1977, the parking lot expanded by closing off Walnut Avenue between 5th and 6th Avenue. It was part of a joint agreement between the library and St. Mark's Lutheran Church. At this time, the library board asked the voters to change the library from a township library to a district library. This means that the library did not depend on a portion of the city taxes, but was able to operate independently from the city. I remember our library went through another change in the 1980s. 
That's right. By 1986, the city's population was over 28,000 people. The library board again asked voters for approval to use nearly $3 million in building bonds and to increase the library's operating tax. The referendum was, in, was approved and in the following year, an additional 35,000 square feet were, were unveiled to the public. The mezzanine helped to create the extra space. The newly expanded space could hold over 240,000 items and could seat 300 people. At the same time, the original Carnegie building and the 1964 building were being remodeled. The Carnegie renovation, funded by a donation from the Delora A. and Lester J. Norris Foundation, was completed in 1989 and allowed the historic building to hold the, businesses, the business, local history, and genealogy collections. Were there any other major renovations or expansion projects in the library between 1990 and 2020? Well, the plans for this renovation project started a few years ago in 2018. Actual construction didn't begin until 2020. So even though construction took a little over a year, assessing the amount of storage needed on the land available, then drafting blueprints took much longer. Library staff and the public were able to contribute ideas on what the space should be. Do you want to share a few of the new features the junior historians and their families will be able to enjoy? Absolutely. So beyond having a lot more space and a natural light throughout the entire building, the library will be home to the STC Creative, which is our new maker lab, an updated computer lab, more study rooms and programming rooms, a snack stop on every floor for people to eat their food and snacks, the loft in the second floor specifically for high schoolers, um, their study booth stand in the youth services specifically for elementary and middle schoolers. Um, there's tons of display space, um, and the youth services will also have an interactive white wall. Um, there's more computers for general use throughout the building and an elevator which goes to all three floors. And then of course we have an outdoor terrace garden that you can hang out throughout the year with beautiful hanging lights. Um, then we can do story times and programs in there. And then my favorite part, having all of the community come back into the building so I can talk to them and greet them and interact with them. That sounds absolutely wonderful. How exciting. Um, I can't wait for everyone to see it. Um, Lindsay, thanks for sharing the history of the library with us. Where can our junior historians learn more? For more information about the history of St. Charles and the library, click the link in the descriptions below to explore the St. Charles History Museum's and library's website. Awesome, thank you. Now join us as we head back to the St. Charles History Museum as we head inside to explore. the St. Charles History Museum. Here from our archives, we have some photographs and items that relate to the history of the St. Charles Public Library. This photograph shows the original building, which is still standing today, that was funded by Andrew Carnegie. We have an interior photo of that same building, which is also still standing. And if you see over here, there's a grandfather clock. This clock is still inside the Carnegie part of the library. We also have this throwback photo from the 1990s, which shows the youth services department. So you can see, I remember when I was a kid, this mural was still up. When the library opens back up, be sure to check that out because it is a lot different than it looked 20 years ago. Also from our archives is a library card from 1984. We also have a baby's first library card from the late 90s, early 2000s. Be sure to visit the St. Charles History Museum to pick up your grab and go kit that relates to the St. Charles Public Library's history through the end of July while supplies last.